Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of TC Talk Back Today with Nerd Video. And in today's video, I wanted to do another Grand Archive video. Super excited about this one. I'm just going to do kind of part one and maybe like a three or four part series of going over each champion in the game. I'm going to kind of give an overarching archetype perspective. I'm not going to go into the weeds of every single level of the champion and different archetypes you can do, but I want to be able to give people who maybe are new to the game or searching for some content in the game, like, you know, what is the basic feel of this champion you know if, if i you know everyone plays a trading card game and they want their deck to have a theme or th like some type of thematic or some type of mechanic that they enjoy so i'm trying to approach showing off these champions from that perspective and hopefully i can do it for you today well let me know in the comments down below whether i do or not but if you're new to the channel welcome thank you so much for stopping by hopefully you enjoy your stay if you're from the grand archive community or you're interested in grand archive welcome uh really appreciate you stopping by if you're a long chain supporter uh feel free to watch this video maybe you'll learn something about champion that you enjoy and get more interested in it because a lot of these champions do have starter decks and they're super easy to pick up and play and then you know uh upgrade from there so we'll get right into it so again as I bring up uh, Nico here, I'm go only going over four champions today. And so I'll, I'll just probably be a multi-part series. Let me know how you like this format. There's so many ways that you could talk about these champions, right? Like we could go over level zero, level one, level two, level three. And that is, you know, something that you can do. However, um, I wanted to kind of just go over like what's the culminating archetype of each champion right now if you if I miss something or anything like that or you think there's something really specific that I should talk about for each champion or you want to see more like in-depth champion by champion breakdowns please let me know down in the comments down below I'm just trying something cool here and hopefully it works out but I want to give you like an overarching theme so maybe it's a champion that you see you could be interested in because i do think for the most part the level two and level three versions of all of these champions in the game are as the the developers intended right like that's the intended overarching feel and archetype so i kind of want to focus on that when it comes to trying to give you a quick guide of like you know why you might want to be interested in this champion but for the first one we're gonna go over nico now nico's like most Nico is a level two champion. Nico Whiplash Allure is a water champion, guardian human. And Nico's whole thing, again, I'm going to kind of give you a key takeaway for each champion. Nico's whole thing is she's a mill deck. She wants to mill her opponent out. Um, much And much like uh, mill decks in a bunch of plethora of games, she has a bunch of different ways she can do that. She does that through, like, you know, automatic effects or through other kind of mechanical, more proactive effects. What I love about Nico is her abilities. So whenever a card with floating memory is banished from your graveyard, put a lash counter on Nico. On champion hit, you may have the opponent put the top X cards of their deck into their graveyard, so they mill that many cards, where X is the amount of lash counters on Nico. So what you're trying to do, and there's a bunch of different ways you can try to do this. You can either do it kind of a tempo quicker way or build up for one big attack. But basically, you're trying to hit with like, let's just say five lash counters. You build up these five lash counters through a plethora of ways, and then you hit your opponent for a bunch of damage, but you also, you know, remove all five lash counters on hit and they mill the top five cards of their deck. So you're able to mill your opponent out while also dealing damage to them. So it creates this like proactive way of mill, which I think is really, really cool. Now there's a bunch of ways that Nico can build these lash counters. One way is, you know, she has even stuff like her weapon, Mage Bane Lash, which on enter put a lash counter on your champion. Mage Bane Lash gets plus one for each lash counter on your champion. And then whenever you're champion is dealt non-combat damage or cover two so it has sustainability so if you bring this in when you have four lash counters it goes up to five lash counters all of a sudden this is swinging for five and if it hits you deal five damage to your opponent and you also if they didn't prevent any, any of it and then you also mill the top five cards of their deck and then reset your lash counters so it's a really cool proactive way of doing it um, you also have cards like fractal rain uh, that say at the beginning of your recollection phase if fractal rain is imbued target player puts the top card of their deck into their graveyard so nico is going to want to mill herself a little bit because she wants to get those cards with floating memory in her graveyard so she can banish them to then build up those lash counters again floating memory can be banished in a bunch of different ways it can be banished through materialization for your, during your material deck uh, for putting out some of your equipment right you also can just do it through other card effects uh, to be able to have these really big attacks uh 
some of her key cards, her most promising or her most like you know declarative one kind of her culminating card is ravishing finale as an additional cost to activate this card banish two cards of floating memory from your graveyard so you'll make two lash counters um on champion hit for each damage counter on the hit champion their controller puts the top two cards from their deck into their graveyard so by my understanding of this card let me know down in the comments below um because i am newer to the game obviously if you hit a champion you're hitting them for six let's just say it's six right they only have six counters on them when this hits it will not only let's just say for argument's sake you don't you have no lash counters before you play this card and you you play this card you banish two cards of floating memory gaining two lash counters then this hits they go up to six get damage counters. So they banish two cards for each damage counter. So for each damage counter the hit champion, their controller puts the top two cards of their deck into their graveyard. So if they have six counters, they banish the top 12, by my understanding, plus the top two from the last counters from Nico's ability. So this card allows you to just banish a ton of cards and get rid of a ton of stuff. So in the late game, if you built up a good amount of last counters and this finds a way to hit, you're able to banish a ton of their cards. Please let me know in the comments down below if I'm wrong on that, but I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm correct. Um, another one is Lost in Thought. Lost in Thought, I really like. Um, it says you may banish up to X cards with floating memory from your graveyard. Draw a card for each card banished this way. So this just allows you to really stack those lash counters really quickly. If you have like four or five cards of floating memory, maybe let's just say you have five and you want to banish four of them to get four lash counters. Maybe you save one because you want to be able to, you know, materialize a card your next turn um you'll create four lash counters and you'll get another floating memory card in your uh grave so you can see this engine of like milling yourself getting those floating memory using those floating memory to get lash counters using those lash counters to then hit them when you hit them to banish top cards of their deck so you have this really proactive mill strategy that's a lot more interactive than you see in a lot of other mill decks in other trading card games which i really enjoy the next one is icebound slam another kind of key card for her uh, this costs two less to activate if you match the class, which she does. Uh, it says, on attack, put the top five cards of your deck into your graveyard. Then if there are five or more water element cards in your graveyard, it gets plus five. So this comes is a five for eight, essentially, that then mills the top five of your deck, which again helps because if you mill floating memory cards, you're going to be able to then banish them to create more lash counters, so on and so forth. So you have this really proactive mill strategy that also allows you to play a little bit combo-esque. So if you like mill strategies and you like active mill and active kind of fatigue plans, Nico, I think, is a really good pick for you. The next one, second out of fourth champion, we're going to do four champions today. This is number two. Uh, this is Jen Undying Resolve. This one was just released uh, in Mortal Ambition. It's a war human champion. Uh, Jin has, you know, several levels to him, no pun intended, when it comes to what he's doing. I'm not going to show off every single level, but Jin's overarching archetype uh, at a base, right, is two things. One, he's using pole arms, either through attacks or weapons, in order to but like have these big attacks but then also give little mini buffs to some of his uh other allies because whenever Jin from level one on whenever Jin attacks with the first time Jin attacks with a polearm weapon or polearm attack he can give a plus one buff for that turn to a to a human or horse he controls um but his other overarching thing is at level three. So he has access to the Exia element, advanced element. It's a very strong element that has some insanely uh, big attacks if done correctly. The one thing is, as long as it's not your end phase, Jin has immortality. So once you get to level three, you, you get this ability. And what this does is two things. One, that means you cannot die until you're in phase. Like if your opponent, if you have, if your life is 28, as you see right there, you can go up to 28 damage counters. If your opponent gets you to 28 damage counters on their turn, the game is not over and it does not end until your next turn ends. So you have until your end of your next turn to either one, kill your opponent or two, get your damage counters back below your max and then you still live so if they get you up to 30 and then you recover five down to down to 25 but before the end of your turn you don't die which is really really good so it creates this game state where Jin can a either try to have a good clap back to finish the game when their opponent overextended to try to kill you or at least threaten to kill you or b play with his life in order to buff a lot of his attacks because a lot of Jin's or pretty much all of Jin's exia offensive weapons have to do with how many damage counters you have on you so one good example of this is blood bond blade sworn such a tongue twister of a card 
Uh, it's a warrior human ally. It says has a class bonus for warrior. It says blood bond, blood bond, blade sworn gets plus one for every ten damage counters on your champion. So for argument's sake, let's say your opponent hits you a lot and you went up to thirty damage counters, and then you play this card. On your turn, this would now be it would get plus three because it gets plus one for every ten counters, and you're at thirty. It's coming in for six six. A three drop six six in this game is unbelievable, insanely good rate. It also has the ability of whenever Blood Bond Blade Sworn is dealt damage, deal that much to your champion. This sounds like a really bad thing, but when you have a, a champion that cares about dealing damage to itself so it can buff its attacks and kill the opponent before it dies itself, it's a really cool. Also, from a lore aspect, this champion isn't like, you know, sadistic or a, a master, how do you say it, whatever the word is. It's not like a sadistic version of dealing damage to itself. It's a noble version. Jin is fighting for someone he cares about in the lore, and that's why he has an undying resolve and he will not die. Kind of like Trindamir in League of Legends. Um, another really cool card is Shanji of Sacrifice. This card is insane. Uh, it's a warrior pole arm, so it triggers Jin's level one ability of giving him plus one whenever you attack with it to a ally or a human ally or, or a horse. And it says for every five damage counters on your champion, Shanji of Sacrifice gets plus one. So again, if we're at 30 damage counters, when we swing with this, it'll get plus six because every five counters, right? Five times six is 30. So it'll come in for seven at a base. And that's not counting if you buff it with like, a savage swing or you know some other type of attack that then you target Jin to then attack with a weapon to be able to have these big big turns Shanji also has this cool ability that says on enter you may have deal five unpreventable damage to your champion uh, if you do draw a card so you're able to basically buff it by plus one and draw a card just by dealing damage to yourself and in certain cases that's what you're wanting to do because you're wanting to go for the kill really really cool now, when it comes to, now, there's a lot of other Exia cards I could show, but, you know, how do you get to this point? How do you get to that level three Exia? Well, you use a lot of the fire package. You use cards like Creative Shock in order to filter and get more hand influence in order to be able to, you know, force yourself up to level up or be able to find the cards you need in order to level up faster. You use cards like Tempered Steel to put durability counters on your weapons so you can swing for those big amounts more continuously. And then you use cards like Clumsy Apprentice and other, you know, damaging cards to yourself uh, in order, Ignited Fate, another one from the new set, in order to deal damage to yourself, continue with your hand and card advantage. And that way, when you get to that Exia, you have these crazy attacks and you're able to close out your opponent before you get to your end phase um, and, you know, uh, lose and win the game before you lose. He also has access to a card called Min Flesh, which costs nothing if he's over 25 damage um counters and he recovers eight so you have insane way like it's a zero cost recover eight in the right situation which is the most above rate recover in the game super super good so if you like aggro decks um that maybe have a culminating like big bonk at the end and but you also like a little bit of you know uh not self mill but you know using your own life as a resource to the fullest extent gym might be a really good ex good one for you then we have Diana. Again, I won't go through level one and two, but Diana's key takeaway and the biggest thing, biggest reason to play Diana is weapons. More so guns. Like if you love Ranger-esque, if you love gun archetypes or like pistol archetypes or like, you know, these big weapons, um, I always say uh, um, Akami the Kill, if anyone knows what that anime is, uh, the girl that has like the giant, huge like rifle that just like, one shot kills everything if you like that kind of style archetype diana is for you uh she does really cool stuff uh she has says she becomes distant and on champion hit generate a creeping torment card and put it on the bottom of the hit champion's lineage you have creeping torments which say on enter put a creeping torment on the bottom of target champion's lineage um and it allows you to have an inherent effect that says whenever you draw your second card each turn deal two unpreventable damage to the object so you can stack Creeping Torment cards on your opponent and then either force them to draw two cards with some of the effects that you have, or um, if they ever want to draw two themselves from like GCR or from like if it's a fire deck like Creative Shock, uh, stuff like that, they'll just keep being dealing damage to themselves. So you put your opponent on a clock. 
They also, Diana also has access to Shadow's Twin, which is an insane gun. It says whenever Shadow's Twin becomes loaded, it gets plus two until end of turn, so it comes up for three. Whenever an attack using this weapon triggers an on-hit ability, that ability is triggered an additional time. So essentially you like double up your damage essentially most of the time. That comes in handy really good with some of the bullets that Diana has. Also, you get to access in your material deck to all of these bullets um, or in your regular deck where you load the gun. So if you love that kind of tactile experience, this is really, really cool. Incendiary Shot is awesome when it when coupled with Shadow's Twin because it has an on-hit effect of dealing two damage to enemy unit. When it comes to Shadow's Twin, that's going to be doubled, so you'll deal four damage to the, to the hit unit on top of the fact that this hits for two and Shadow's Twin hits for three. You just get this... You stack up these huge, huge attacks uh, with your gun, and if they, as long as your opponent doesn't have a way to disrupt you, which sometimes can be Shadow's Twin's downfall. It's the reason I think that Diana is not as meta relevant as she could be, but it's still an insanely fun deck. Um, Taser Shot's really cool. Has on champion hit until the beginning of your next turn. Whenever a hit champion levels up, deal 400 preventable damage. So if you couple this with Shadow's Twin, it deals that twice. So eight damage. And then you have Play a Bullet, which is a recurring bullet that you can keep using over and over. So really, really cool. She also has access to other guns other than Shadow's Twin. That's just the most marquee one. Um, but really awesome. If you love a tactile kind of gun weapon experience, like one shot, one kill sniper esque, you know, if you're that play style in other games, cards or not, this might be a good champion for you to try. And then finally, my favorite one, and I'm going to do a separate video on Tristan. This is the champion I know the most. Um, Tristan is an assassin. So Tristan's whole thing from level one and level two is she's basically trying to build prep counters um, like a lot of other assassins in this game and then use those prep counters in order to facilitate a lot of value with her advanced element in Umbra and specifically her level three Tristan Shadow Dancer. She has two level threes, but this is the most most used one. Um, on enter, summon two ominous shadow tokens and put a preparation counter on Tristan. I should have shown the ominous shadow tokens, but basically they are one for four uh, Fantasia tokens that basically say um, if you if Tristan would be targeted by an attack. You can remove two uh, preparation counters and redirect that attack to one of those ominous shadow tokens, which have four, def four health. The thing with ominous shadow tokens is every time they're hit, every time damage is dealt to them, prevent three of that damage. So if the ominous shadow token is hit for four, three of it's going to be prevented. They're only hit for one. So you essentially have to hit them for like, in one instance, you would have to hit them for seven in order to kill them or hit and that's every instance so they're very very difficult so basically so long as you have sh preparation counters you can essentially just pre almost prevent tristan from being hit now there's ways around some ways around it but typically um, that's how that works you also can use your preparation counters offensively with cards like shadow strike shadow strike says prepare x x can't be zero shadow strike gets plus x if shadow strike was prepared it has unblockable so basically you can use those uh, counters to prepare it so let's say you have four preparation counters when you cast shadow strike you prepare it for four let's say you use all four of them it'll come in for eight which makes it unblockable and it ignores taunt so tristan will attack for eight with shadow strike and then um your ominous shadow tokens which can attack for one they only can attack if tristan has hit this turn so you'll attack for eight and then each ominous shadow token will attack for one so she has these tokens that like you know, it's like this kind of true assassin where you don't know where she's at because she's using her tokens to kind of wisp you away. But then when she goes in for the kill, she uses her tokens to then help kill you. Shadow's Claw is also really cool. As long as you have four more preparation counters on your champion, you may activate this card from your material deck. Fantasia allies you control um, can attack using Shadow's Claw. When they do, put a durability counter on shadows call so it's just this reoccurring attack again you can use cards um like grim foreboding which is really really good summon another ominous shadow token fantasia allies you control get plus one until the end of turn and you gain agility three uh so basically you play this card and it creating another ominous shadow and then you couple it with shadow strike so now tristan will attack for let's just say you prep it four times tristan attacks for eight and then each one of your ominous shadow tokens that normally attack for one will now attack for two 
They also can use Shadow's Claw, so now they'll attack for three. So, and because you put a durability counter on Shadow's Claw every time you attack with it, um, it basically like doesn't go down in durability at all. So on like a typical Shadow Strike um, Grim Foreboding turn, if you prep four, Tristan will swing for nine with Shadow's Claw. Then you can start swinging with your uh, with your Omni Shadow tokens, they'll get plus one from Grim Foreboding. They have one themselves and plus one from Shadow's Claw. So you're swinging for three. So if you have three of those tokens, you're swinging for eight with Tristan and then three, three times. So you're swinging for like 17 if it's not prevented or like has a way of uh, being dealt with. So you can get these super good offensive turns. She also used can card use other really powerful umber cards like Shadow Reconnaissance and Haunting Demise for other outs. Shadow Reconnaissance allows you to recover two and then draw a card. If your champion has four more prep counters, you can summon another token. Um, Haunting Demise uh, basically is similar to Diana's effect where it puts your opponent on a clock. On champion hit, put a Haunting Demise on the bottom of the on hit champion's lineage, and it says at the beginning of your recollection phase, deal one on preventable damage. So basically, however many counters they have until they die, that's how many turns they have left, no matter what happens. So how do you get to this point? Well, you put prep counters on your on her in order to then pop off when you get to that Umbra element. She's able to do this with cards like Black Market Broker. Um, Surveil the Winds is really good. Windwalker Boots. This deck, in my opinion, does not function as well without this card. Um, at the beginning of your end phase, if your champion is awake, put a prep counter on them. So you just can continuously gain prep counters every turn. So you just basically never banish this card unless you have to, uh, if you really need that card draw. But really, really good. And you're able to survive doing all of this by using the wind element, using cards like Dream Fairy and Veiling Breeze and Reclaim, these kind of control -y tools in order to prevent your opponent uh, from doing what they want to do until you get to that big Umbra element. So... Hopefully this made sense. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, I, again, you could make a two hour video on one on one champion. You really could. And I'm trying to give people kind of a quick snapshot on like the pinnacle of each champion, right? If you would like me to go more in depth on one of these champions, like go over their level one, go over their level two, go over the level three, please let me know down in the comments below. Um, but I am gonna do probably a part two and part three to this series where I go over more champions as far as their pinnacle archetype and like what they're all about. Um, but if you enjoyed this, please let me know. I'd love to hear it. If you didn't enjoy this, if you think it's a little bit too confusing or just too general, also let me know that. I'm trying to do kind of a different style of champion overview than I've seen other creators do in the game. So hopefully this was, you know, clear and concise enough for you. Um, even with me just barely going over four champions at like their height level three, you have a 22 minute video. You know, so this could go on and on if you wanted to. But if you like this type of content, please leave a like, comment, or subscribe. If not me, it's totally fine. Go to another Grand Archive creator, leave a like, comment, subscribe on their stuff. Let's get more people playing this game, having fun with it. And yeah, I'll see y'all next time on TC Talk. Y'all be safe.